So, um, first of all, thank you very much for coming this morning uh, to this session about um, practicing languages in a virtual world. I have to admit, I'm very, very happy that you're here. Because yesterday, I was actually quite worried. And I'll tell you why. Yesterday, we went for a very nice little lunch in the park in front of the Reichstag. Had a nice weather, we were having good food, and suddenly, uh, you know, as the lunch was drawing to an end, uh, I asked some of uh, the persons here that I did not mention, actually, and I said to her, hey, which session are you going to tomorrow morning? <laughs> and I showed her proudly, you know, the, the timetable we have here, and she looked at this and I, huh, and she points at this thing and said, I'm definitely not going to that one. <laughs> that one. So that made me feel really good. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, then I think, okay, and then I asked her why. And she said, you know what? The virtual world thing sounds extremely boring. So if I see you yawning, uh, I'll try to do my best. So if you get bored, just yawn a bit, and I'll try to get the hint. Okay? So, virtual worlds. Um, first, I'd like to start knowing uh, and ask you how many languages do you speak, just to have an idea. Uh, who speaks more than four, around four languages, four to five languages? Okay, I see some uh, hands moving like this. Uh, six to seven languages. All right, more than seven? Okay, yeah, yeah, of course. So the, the major issue is actually, uh, for all of us then, is how much time does it take not only to learn those languages, but how much time does it take to maintain them and to develop them, practice them. And I guess, I mean, in my experience, it's really a lot of time just to maintain and practice, go and meet people, practice those languages. Now, how can you do that? How can you practice all those languages in a convenient way? Now, the first thing that we all have tried, and we did this yesterday in the past days, we just get together, go and have a nice uh, little coffee, lunch or whatever, have a meeting and we practice languages together. So, what I've done, and uh, using Facebook once in a while, for example, a Chinese get together, let's meet together next week on Tuesday at 7 p.m. and we practice Chinese. There is also another website called Meetup. I don't know if you use it here, Meetup? Yeah, okay. So Meetup, you see, okay, there's a Chinese meeting next week, let's go there. Fantastic. On va sortir is a French version of that. In Paris it's quite, uh, it's used a lot. And we have our own little app we developed a uh, few years ago, LanguageX, that helps you find exchange partners. But there are also many other apps like this. Now, that's the physical part when you want to practice a language, is to meet others. Okay, time consuming. Now luckily, nowadays we have the internet. So where can you practice? Online. Yes, you see, we have Omni Simon's Omniglot here. <laughs> Philippe, are you here? Asimil, uh, Blue Blue, of course. So you can practice in a lot of very, very really great uh, website and online. And I've used them, those, those sites, and for, for, for many years by now. And uh, it's really a fantastic experience. Now, for example, it gives you a great understanding of writing systems, with your sounds and many other things. But how do you get closer to the physical experience of meeting each other? How do you get to this experience that you go to a cafe and practice the language as we did yesterday evening, for example? How do you do that? <laughs> virtual world is a possibility. This very boring name, virtual worlds, is one solution that brings you basically physically, virtually together. Now, I guess you know Second Life? Yeah, yeah Second Life? Yeah. Very few, okay, like 10%? Yeah. And um, have, you, have you used it for language practicing? No, nobody. Nobody has used Second Life for language practicing. Wow, okay, good. Well, actually, Second Life, most of Second Life is about language practicing. But it's just a virtual world. So what is a virtual world, actually? 
it's a computer-based simulation environment, but for multiple users. Uh, and I'm going to demo that in a few, in a few minutes. And uh, what I found fantastic at that is that you can connect from wherever you are, appear as an avatar, a virtual, like in a computer game, but instead of shooting each other, you can practice languages together. You can interact with your environment. You can simulate scenarios, like going to the French bakery. And then uh, you're the baker. Hello. Bonjour. J'aime bien une baguette. And then you, I can buy a baguette from you uh, in this virtual world. Of course, you can always go to Paris and buy a baguette over there, but I cannot do that every week. World of Warcraft. And what is fantastic in this, it's a great, great thing. Millions of people use that. And in World of Warcraft, I talked to some of the, the kids doing One of us was a student in Hong Kong of ours. And he, want, he wanted to learn, he was learning English. And actually, he's a gamer. He was playing seven hours a day World of Warcraft. Totally addicted. But his English got actually quite good. And I wanted, he was a very bad student at school. Clever in, in my mind, he was a clever guy, but he was a bad student, according to teachers. But his English was getting actually quite good. Why? He was chatting all the time in World of Warcraft. He was using this virtual world, going around, raiding villages around the virtual world. Let's go and raid, so 200 people would get together, let's go and raid village over there. And they would attack this village, coordinating each other, using English, and communicating that way. He's, he's Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese. So, that's what virtual worlds can offer. Now, it, yeah, oh, question, sorry, yeah. Just one question, sorry. Yes, uh, go ahead. Have you ever played more about the Warcraft? Is it uh, only in English or uh, for the people use it in other languages as well? From what I know, it's in English. Um, what I've seen was people communicate in English. There's probably some communities that use this only in, uh, probably in Chinese, or a two-headed village there, or Chinese, or French, or whatever, but I've only seen it in English. Um, so just a tiny bit of history, all these virtual worlds. Um, it actually, Second Life, was launched in 2003, so 11 years basically. And um, the first time, very beginning in 2005, you already had a, a school called Language Lab, which is quite a famous one, that went into Second Life and provided and provides language training. So you go in there and uh, in a virtual setting, and you can practice English, for example. Now, two years later, they added something very important that made actually virtual worlds much more interesting than it was at the beginning. Only the chatting at the beginning. Now in 2007, they added a key functionality uh, to, 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 as far as I'm concerned, is voice over IP. So you're able now to go in there and talk. Like you use Skype, you can use voice over IP in Second Life. Which means, instead of having to chat all the time, you can talk. You can, you're not obliged to. And that's a, a great thing, because you can simulate an environment. You can then chat with people, so practice the, the writing part, practice the reading part, and also the speaking and listening, while being really engaged in a game. And in 2010 only, one of my friend, close names of him, he made also a speech in TEDx, created a school called 3D Avatar in Hong Kong. Went to the south of China and used this technology, something like Second Life, very close, to make the kids practice English. That was a great success. Because the kids would go there and play games. It's not about learning a language. It's about playing, interacting, like for World of Warcraft. You interact. The, the purpose is not anymore uh, to, to learn the language. It's not at all. The language is just a vehicle, just a means to have fun. And the kids love it. And not only the kids. So, uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's maybe have a better look at that. So, here is what it could look like, or it does look like at least. Um, in Hong Kong, we had this, um, in Switzerland, we had this uh, virtual world. And you see that's a shang tian. It's, uh, it's a shop where you can practice buying expensive luxury watches, for example, <laughs> for tourists. You can also go to the bar, to a bar, and interact Bar, have a drink, invite a nice girl to a drink. And actually, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to invite this beautiful woman over there, somewhere in Switzerland. Marion, you still here? Hey. 
Okay, I'm going to invite her for a drink in a virtual setting. So, sure. Yeah, well, let me do that. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, just have to find. There we go. All right. So let's first use only the the the, the charting thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So now she says to me, okay, me. Okay. So, we are communicating. You say hello to me. Oh, I'll say hello to you. We're a bit shy, okay? So we don't want to talk to each other now. So we're just going to chat. It's more, you know, it's premise. We are just starting the relationship now. So, okay. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. She's inviting me for a drink already. I mean, she's, she's not shy. She's not shy. I am French. <laughs> okay, she's not shy. Okay, so you invited me to the bar. Fantastic. Let me answer to you. <laughs> He's in my pocket already. Hey, wait for me. Okay, where are you going? Oh, well. Oh, wow. I thought, hey, you look good. <laughs> Cheers. Sexual, I sexual harassment and virtual will. <laughs> you, you don't want to wait for me, right? <laughs> where are you? I'm just behind you. I'm looking at you. Ah. Oh. Actually, you can put, uh, girls, you can put very nice clothes here, if that's the motivation. <laughs> God, she's not right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay, let me show you what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now we're at the bar, stop running. I, I'm not running at all. Yeah, but I had to run after you. <laughs> You're just too slow for me. <laughs> Better went too fast. Anyway. Okay. Alright. So we sit here. Okay. Now, there we go. Mm -hmm. What do you want to drink? <clears throat> Um, yeah, Sound like color. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you order that, Bowman can play. One of you could log in the virtual worlds, be the waiter, I could be the waiter, and then we all interact that way. Now the cool thing with this kind of system is that you can be two, you can be one, clicking around and interacting, like in a regular online e-learning system. You can be two as we are now, you can be three. It can be four, it can be ten, it can be a hundred thousand millions. Okay, so, okay, let's say you would have a, a Coke, for example, or whatever, and you can simulate ordering different drinks. But now, let's say you have your Coke, okay? Okay, what must you tell me? Are you inviting me? <laughs> so hey, now that now is getting interesting. She is inviting me now for a dance. That's that. So I'll just follow her again. <laughs> it's tough, you know like. Am I still too fast for you? <laughs> You're too fast for me. Cool. I'll follow you. I'll let me jump. Sure, how about <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I like it. You're <laughs> following. Nice. Can you fly in there? Well, what was your question? Sorry. She's gone. Can you She's gone. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, so I have to concentrate. Okay, what do you say? Can you dance and fly at the same time? Uh, that's, that's the, uh, I, I can like see that. Like a ghost. Uh, we cannot, not yet. But we'll we'll think about that. <laughs> okay, Marion. Chiba. Uh, 
。好。好啊。你在哪儿？我在这儿。我在这儿。对。OK。Open。All right. Let me ask you something. Yes. You 会跳舞吗？哈哈。Of course I can dance, baby. 我会跳。Show me. I have to show to you. Show me. <laughs> I can do the same thing in real. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, we could go on and on and on. Uh, do you want to show us briefly around maybe the virtual world, Marion? We would follow you. Um, yeah, sure. Just, uh, just to let you see. And um, so let's we'll follow you and we fly. We fly us around a bit. All right. Let's fly. So um. Let's say we want to take a flight together. Yes. What do we do then? Go to the airport, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Airport is good. You don't need a plane. Yes. No, we don't need a plane. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can simulate buying tickets. Where so, would you like to go? The bank. Oh, the bank. Yes, that's fantastic. Let's go to the bank. Where's the bank? Oh, there we go. She's already gone. <laughs> <laughs> now the cool thing here, if you go to the bank first, you can discover. How you say a bank? In Han, in Chinese, but it could be another language. Okay. And for those of you who have uh, LMS, e-learning management systems in your big companies or your own little companies, this kind of data can be taken directly from the LMS. So the virtual world here is just a 3D interface that makes it possible to display information. Now, if you display this information as um, just on an app, you know, on a, a little app on your mobile phone, or if you display it in a virtual world like this, it's the same. But here it, it takes the data in Han, the pinyin, as well as the Chinese character, and it's going <coughs> to this virtual interface. So, yeah, that's the bank, and we could be like, Marion could be, for example, let's get into the bank right now. You could go behind the counter, exactly, and we could simulate, um, basically open, getting... Open, Ooh, there's getting, a safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we could actually simulate having a credit card and something like that. Stop flying. There we go. Okay. So the cool thing is there we go. Miha. Oh, and she's greeting me. So we can but I'll answer again. So basically, that's the, um, you can actually teleport, you can go to different places in uh, the virtual world and create, we have plenty of islands like this that we built over the past uh, four years that make it possible for you to simulate a uh, little village in Thailand, mountains, retreats, bank, etc. And you can then, I guess you can see that you can practice the language you want in, in these scenarios, which you cannot do that in the physical world. You cannot go to the bank and practice with it. <laughs> Yeah, you see what I mean? Bank practice with the guys at the bank and uh, say, here yeah, would like a Chinese uh, credit card, please. Can you rob the bank? You can rob, actually, the robbing the bank is a, is a very good question. And each time we said, okay, in, uh, in the Hong Kong at that case, we said, hey, um, what kind of things would you like to learn? And it was business guys, you know, like in big companies, and said, I'm, like, I'm learning Russian, and the first thing I would like to do is to learn how to rob a bank. <laughs> I regard this like 90% of the time. <laughs> so yes, you can rob a bank, and that's exactly the next topic later I'm going to speak about. Is virtual worlds are the basis, but on top of that, you need to have gamification, game mechanics. That's the next slide. Game mechanics to make the whole experience interesting. So robbing the bank is exactly one of those, and that's how virtual worlds become very interesting. Okay, Marion. Um, I think we right. could go on like this, but uh, I'm going to go on with the with the rest of the PowerPoint presentation. Sure, hey. it was nice playing around with you. Uh, and thanks for the drink. Thank you very much. Huh? <laughs> Have a good one. You could stay online. Thank you. Cheers. Sure, sure. Bye. There we go. Alright. So you've seen the two bar and uh, the different people. <clears throat> now, virtual worlds, for quite a while, people said in 2003, 
It's fantastic. It's amazing. Nobody used them. There's about a million people maybe in Second Life, and everybody thought it's dead. It is not. It's still growing, but very, very slowly. And there is this uh, thing that happens with innovation, as probably you know. It's called the hype, <coughs> the hype cycle. So we're all speaking about the technology. 2001, a mobile phone that is able to go online. A mobile phone that can, we can use your mobile phone, your little Nokia from that time, using a technology called WAP that enables you to access the internet. It's crazy, right? It's science fiction. In 2001, it was tested, it was a total failure. Now, we all have iPhones and everything. We all do that. Now, there is something that I really like very much, and that might also help you guys if you, for those who haven't seen that one, I love this one. It's called the, for innovation, it's called the Hype Curve from the Gartner Group. And I usually have used, I've been using this for many years. Because these guys do a great job in, in simplifying technologies. Not technologies, but simplifying which are the next big technologies coming. They give you an, an idea. And this hype curve, what it does, <clears throat> this is the time dimension, and this is the visibility, uh, how much you speak about the stuff. So let's say, 10 years ago, we spoke about mobile, uh, mobile phones, a little, the old Nokia, going online with WAF. Everybody speaks about it. You would find this in all IT magazines and everything. What is the big thing? And I was working with these things. And what actually was a total failure. It was not ready. It was, I mean, there were plenty of issues at that time. But everybody spoke about it. So technology trigger, the internet, what, etc. Everybody spoke about it. Doesn't work. We all disappointed and we go in there. Nobody, nobody speaks about it. Now there's this guy called Steve who comes a few years later and he tries again something with the iPhone. In the meanwhile, things have become ready. There's a plateau of productivity. That's where you start entrepreneurs here. That's where you usually cash in. So if you go into a technology, and this technology enters in that slope of an advent, you enter here and you go there. That's where your company, your startup or your big multinational company starts making the money. Now I looked at the hype curve for 2010. I didn't take the one for 2014 on purpose, but 2010. And here you see all the different technologies. Some of you might know cloud computing, uh, all these things. Cloud computing is here. Now it means everybody speaks about it in 2010, and it's going to be adopted within two to five years. We are in 2014. We all, most of us use cloud computing. We have the iPhones, all our data are not stored necessarily locally on the phone but they're stored in the cloud, online, in a Facebook, in a, in an app. So, for virtual worlds, they have public virtual worlds here. And they said, okay, five to 10 years before they could become mainstream. And in that time, virtual world was really not, they had a very bad impression, because Second Life was considered to have failed. It went through the peak, the Second Life was there, everybody spoke about it, and then it failed, or it was only for geeks, hardcore geeks. And um, then people don't didn't use that. But in the meanwhile, those virtual worlds have matured. Voice of IP, bandwidth, etc., and they are fantastic. Matthew and I and, and some uh, colleagues in Hong Kong did tests in Hong Kong and two years ago also in Switzerland. It was just amazing. Students just love it. So the hype curve is an interesting thing. Any questions? So virtual worlds is the, it's like the foundation, it's like a highway if you want. But if you have a highway, you need something on top of that. And what's, up, what's on top of this is how do you make it interesting? And it's gamifying the content. So you take these banks, you take these shops, and you go and rob the bank. And that's where it, it starts to have value. And that's what has been missing in many cases for virtual worlds, especially for things like uh, second Life, because Second Life said, okay, we give you a highway, we give you this virtual, this highway, this virtual world is there, now you do whatever you want, no purpose, no purpose, so you just arrive in the virtual world, I did this the first time, like I tried Second Life a few years ago, and I was like, what is that crap, you know, I just arrived, I'm lost, I'm alone in a virtual world, I'll go around, the first avatar I go to, just like say, hi, hi, and so what do we do, you know, like, there's no purpose. Now, 
If you gamify this, if you give a purpose, say you have to rob the bank, now we get together. You bloody bandits. We get together and we're gonna attack that bank. Alright? That's the gamification aspect. And uh, that's a word that now multinational companies are really looking into right now, 2014. So gamification uh, is the process of using game thinking and game mechanics to engage audiences and solve problems. Uh, that's not for me, from Gib Zickerman. It's, um, it's a specialist in this area. And it's an incredible way of engaging students. When we made tests in Hong Kong or in Switzerland, we had to unplug or switch off the Wi-Fi to kick the students out of the room, in the classroom. Now, I don't know, but take 10 students who are about 12 years old and try to teach them French. They are Chinese students. They hated it. And our teacher was really a cool guy. He was a really nice chap, likeable, they loved him, but he was boring. And you know, one, two hours learning French, so like, they didn't like it. Now we made a test. We brought all these computers here. And, um, and put the kids in front of us. No, we didn't put the kids. We put actually the mother's king initially. And we had this big table in our center over there with all the kids around it, their mothers, and the mothers were in front of the computer. And we switched up on the virtual world. They were using it, and they were trying it. They were supposed to learn French, practice French, you know? Uh, va à la banque, demande une carte de crédit, or something like this. The mothers were trying, trying first to find out how they could move around. It was a total catastrophe. And then you saw these little hands, suddenly. You have the mother here, and you have the, 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 the kid just next to you. And you saw the little hands, slowly but surely, pushing the mother's hands on the side, taking over the control. It was fantastic. It happened all around the table. And you had all the kids slowly taking over, taking over, and they were in power. And then, they started using the virtual world. They started chatting, they started speaking, and they started messing up our complete virtual world. Because you can create your own stuff in there. So they started creating buildings, uh, big balls, and putting things together, and practicing the language at the same time. We did not believe what we saw. It was just, wow. I didn't believe it, and I still actually when I said that. Wow, <laughs> amazing. So it's a fantastic way to engage students of any age. And we try this with uh, top managers from big companies in Hong Kong, and they were traveling a lot. And initially they said, ah, you, you know, you're virtual world, that's kind of that's crap stuff, you know. Uh, I don't believe in that. They changed their mind. And that was in spite of all the problems that I'm going to speak about in a few slides. I need some more. So that's great, but some of you might, you know, work in companies, big companies, have your own internet uh, companies or your own little companies. <clears throat> so what's in it for you? Well, the good news is the virtual worlds are not just only for four-way geeks that you will never reach. It was the case a few years ago when we started setting up something like this. It was a pain. It was extremely difficult. And there are still quite some difficulties in some areas. <clears throat> but the good news is, if you want, you can set up something possible. Um, so you can use different technologies. It can be second line where you go in there and it's a well-established company and you say I want to rent an island and on this island you can then create what you want. You can create your bank, your language school, uh, you can if you are a big company like an Alstom or whatever you can create your whole trains in this virtual world and simulate your company processes there. Like how do we build if it's a Mercedes, how do we build a Mercedes? And you can play who's the first one to take all the parts and put them together. <coughs> it's just an idea like this. So you can use Second Life, where you rent an island in OpenSea, which is an open source project. And you download this, this code and put it in the web server, and then you're going to be able to have your own new world. It's a bit complex, to be honest, but it's interesting. Or Unity 3D, which is used for most of the games, many games nowadays. Now the challenge is, Get people in a virtual world is really difficult initially because it's quite difficult to move around when you do it on the computer. And I'll show you what the mitigations are for that. But it's quite difficult to get in the virtual world because you need to use to know how to, to move around. If you're a gamer, 
that piece of cake. The little hands of the kids there, they were just, I didn't have to explain them anything. They were just moving around. But the mothers were completely lost and thought, this is really crap. It's impossible to use. How do you move forward? How do you go back? How do you speak? How do you chat? How do you? No, it was too complex. So we had to look for a solution for that. But virtual world, once you get people in a virtual world with those technologies, and once they know how to use it, it's just amazing. Um, so the opportunities are great because you can do things you would never do if you are a trainer, like language teachers, or any language teachers here? If you're language teachers, or if you are management tra trainers, you know, you can really create things that you cannot do in a, in a, in a physical classroom. And you can let your, your creativity go as far as you want. We created a big cheeseburger in the air, where you can, yeah, I know. <laughs> we create a big cheeseburger flying somewhere in the sky, where you can go and have, and with chairs and sofas, where you can just sit around and, and discuss and interact. Sounds crazy, it is, it's a lot of fun. Because then start, people start expanding, thinking about things they would never think otherwise. Your limitation is your, but is your creativity, not the technology. So, and it's not about only the third point here, it's not only about technology, actually it's not. It's about really, what I said, your imagination. How much, what's in here, what can you do, what, to make your students really want to learn and to help people practice languages. And the cool thing with this, for me, the virtual world was not just a project for others, but it was for me. So there's a need. When you are, like here, a polyglot, I want to practice today Danish. Tomorrow I want to practice Mandarin Chinese. Next day I want to practice Russian. Schwitzerdeutsch, Alsatian, French, Italian, Portuguese, whatever you want, or maybe that tiny little language I've never heard of, and I would be interested in being able, and I saw that on an omniglot, and I said, hey, I, come on, I want to try this little thing. Where do I do this, right? I can hear recordings, now I want to interact with people, and we are scattered around the world. You can create communities online and interact and speak with them, as you could see before. So for a polyglot, I mean, for me, it's a great way of practicing those languages. And if I'm shy, so I can just hide behind my avatar. You don't know what I look like. And I can just, you know, interact with the people. And when I feel more comfortable, I'll be able to use voice. When I feel more comfortable, I can maybe use Skype or whatever. So I have a different tools for different purposes that make me, until I reach my confidence, that I can interact physically. That's the need. Actually, yeah. Um, it's a bit earlier than expected, but uh, I'm not going to make it drag on. So I would just say one thing. If you have questions, you're welcome. But um, thank you for your, your, your attention. Seeing Google Zhe Zhao. And uh, if you want to, to contact me, that's, feel free to send me an email at, uh, at these emails. Uh, it goes to the same thing. Yeah? Bilingua is just uh, the old, the new, the name we created a while ago for Global Citizens. It's the same thing. And, um, I'll just do a bit of short advertising. There's this little app we created a long while ago, Language X, to help you meet language partners. It functions in a web, in a web browser, and uh, go through the website, and you can download it. So you say, hey, I would like to practice with someone next to me. Um, and uh, you have your profile, and it tells you who you can do. So thank you for your attention, and uh, questions are welcome. Yes. Yeah. So let's say I want to go to second life, uh, find myself in such an environment, like the one in Chavez, and practice languages. Uh, can I do that for free, or does it cost something? Uh, I'll repeat the question just so that I don't understand. Uh, can I go to second life and practice for free languages? Uh, the, the answer is yes. There are different qualities, of course, but yes, you can. So there is this uh, the language lab. There are different islands where you can go and say per language, per topic. Um, and some of them you have to pay, of course, or you know you have first year interact for free, and then you can have more. But yes, you can, uh, and you can actually, if you want, you can go in second life, tell other uh, from us, hey, I want to practice that language with you. Let's meet on that day. And uh, yeah. but uh, uh, simulating that environment, like building a bar or a dam, is that is that for free or does one have to pay? No, and that's the reason why I used um, 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 other technologies because it can get a little bit expensive with, with time. So if you if you create your own virtual world, which is much more complex, of course, but then you can create whatever you want. Into it. In Second Life, you rent an island. Then for each object you're gonna like um, each object you're going to to import, create in that virtual world, 
you will have to pay a little something. It's not a fortune, but you can add up uh, to this thing. And you know, never know how long the platform stays. So I like to have my own stuff, and then, but if you want concretely, you can quite easily rent a little island, create a few cubes, I could show that later to you if you want, create a few cubes that look like a house after a while, put some, you know, some nice colors on the walls, and you have your school uh, quite fast. At a low, no, no IT skills really needed. Uh, yeah, Richard? I'm just wondering um, how easy it would be to recreate the same type of thing using a, a Google um, Street View so that you can actually have a real city where you're intending to go. So I think I'd find that really useful if I was looking for the bank and I wanted to go, let's say I want to go and live in Tbilisi or I want to go and spend a month there. And if I actually see the real city and how it's set out. So when I go there, it's not so alien to me. Yeah, good question. So can you use basically Google Street View uh, and implement this in such a virtual world? Uh, we, we thought about something like this. Um, there's probably a way, but I think technically uh, to interact with this kind of virtual world, I would expect, I, if we haven't tried that, that it could be quite uh, tricky uh, to re reproduce it. But I'm sure it's doable. But we haven't done that. I've seen some experimentation with uh, card games. Uh, yeah. use like uh, real series from uh, Google like uh, maps, but I haven't seen this kind of uh, yeah, virtual world. Because the interface, interfacing this, and there is also one thing with the virtual world, like uh, it consumes, I was actually worried that the Wi-Fi would let us down this morning. So if you have something that goes wrong, it consumes quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of traffic on this. So if you need a high quality, it's a bit difficult to, to reproduce it um, in, in a seamless way. And one of the, the, the issues we had, I had initially with the virtual world, I thought, my God, that's ugly. The kids we had were coming in here, and that looks insane. That's like our website. I don't know where that. <laughs> it's like uh, it looks like from the 80s. And the first time we showed that to students, I felt ashamed. I really felt ashamed. Like, my God, these kids are going to tear it apart. And you know what? Not at all. Actually, they play World of Warcraft. They like they chat. They don't even need voiceover IP. And World of Warcraft, the graphics are, yeah, it's like a Tetris in a way. But they don't care. Because what they focus on is really the game mechanics. You get involved in what you are doing, the interaction with other people, the, the purpose you're trying to, to reach, and not in how it looks. The look is the first five minutes, like for your girlfriend, boyfriend. Uh, it, it's the, the important thing is really the, the interaction with it. So, uh, the look is not the key aspect in many cases. What do you think is the... Um like uh, one thing, like robbing the bank, is uh, let's say gamification for a group. But for myself, like uh, in terms of uh, motivation and learning language, what kind of uh, gamification, like uh, you know, numbers? Do you have any idea about uh, to use any number? What kind of feedback do I get from the virtual world that I'm improving in way? We did some tests for the. We asked feedback from students. Um, when at some point we had voice over IP, big issues with voice over IP didn't work, some scenarios were buggy, etc. And we asked the students at the end of the sessions, what do you think? They loved it. We have all the papers, etc. They just like, it's fantastic. It was really a, uh, so the interaction, even with a very minimal set of gamification on top of that, the interactions, people would create their own thing, and it was, they, they, they just loved it. Did I answer your question? Yeah. I'm just checking. Yeah. In the yeah. second life, how do you find the people of the language that you, if you go to their, if you go to a country, if you fly over to a country, how do you find the language that you want? That's very often the issue. Uh, what you can do is you can look for uh, islands. So you say there is an English island, a so German island, etc. And uh, you go there. But very often when they are very structured, then you have, of course, to pay for that. Otherwise, just a, a regular exchange when you say, let's just meet up and, and practice whatever languages together, like polyglot evening, something like this. Uh, it's much more random, it's difficult to find the right people, but you don't have a, a real profile, an easy way to look for that. So it's a bit, that's still, that's still a big challenge there and a big opportunity, I believe, in this area. But to answer your question, there are islands by targets. So you can fly in. Yeah. So why are you sure as it was, uh, it wasn't taken by? No, it's, the, your product. it's our system, yes. Yeah. That's we built implemented a few years ago. Can we come in there? Yes, no problem. Yeah. Can I practice 
French for sure. Finish. Uh, fin okay, that's a virtual world. But finish, what you would have to do is like, we would have to say at 6 p.m., it's like a physical premise. At 6 p.m. today, we meet and we'll have 10 of us here practicing Finnish. So if you're just logging by yourself, you're going to be alone, probably. Now, the, the goal is to get a lot of people in such a system. But for now, you can go there and you would have to invite others as you would do on a Skype conference. But yes, you can. And you could actually create your own, your own Finnish environment. You can create, if you want, you can create your own Finnish school or, or uh, sauna, whatever. And you can go and speak in a virtual sauna. You know, and you could change your clothes if you want in a, in a sauna clothes or whatever. Yeah, because that will work, like Richard was saying. You, know, if you can kind of uh, approximate to what Finland fin looks like. You know, you will have uh, alcohol, sauna, yes. and <laughs> reindeers, and forests, and lakes, and some church, and yeah, somebody on the street from. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can talk about these things that you will talk anyway in real life. So. <laughs> I'm looking forward to his game. We have in the back. They don't dare promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, that's about his spirit. Yes? Um, this isn't a question, it just kind of builds on what you're saying. So, with this kind of community that we have sitting here, yeah. we could organize like some kind of evenings to keep in touch with each other and practice languages with each other to get more people involved as opposed mm -hmm. to just a message board or a blog. No oh, clearly, yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what, we should make a conference on the yeah. virtual world. <laughs> <laughs> we should recreate this hostel, even with the rooms, and then have the, you know, the flirting, the discussion. Leave that in, guys. And I want to be with Ruslan again in the room. And yeah. Like yeah, like, yeah, and you can. Yeah, and that path to the bar should be open all the time. <laughs> yes, we can change the, you know, virtual world always open, we can make noises and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But actually, what, one, one uh, more serious thing is, a few years ago, what happened, four years ago, there was a, typh a big typhoon, I think, in Taiwan or something. And uh, Mario, if you're still here, maybe you, you know about that. But there was, um, uh, there, there was a big, the internet basically was shut for, for Taiwan. That was a big issue. And that was a big, I worked in reinsurance before. And, um, it was a big issue because that all these reinsurers, I mean insurance, insurance companies, extremely exciting, uh, um, uh, world. And what they did is they had this conference that was supposed to take place in Taiwan. Now, the whole island was shut down, no internet, whatever, it was a total catastrophe. So they had to relocate somewhere. And you had all these expensive executives from around the world that you have to fly. And they had their plane tickets, hotels, booked in Taiwan. What do you do? Oh, let's go move to Hong Kong or, Ta or Tokyo. Not very nice. Actually, someone got the idea to do uh, such a virtual world where executives met online. Mm -hmm. And it was a great success. So you have this kind of, as you say, like a ability to, it's really a, a, a mirror from the physical. It's a complement. It doesn't replace, but it's a complement uh, to uh, the, the physical meetings uh, you have. There. And you can be so immersive that you don't even notice the distance. It sounds weird, but you try, you, know, you see that. Yes? I'm thinking how beautiful it will be. Imagine this conference. It will be in this virtual conference two weeks before the conference. Yeah. In a way, we would have already like you know warm up. You know what you want to talk with, and mm -hmm. uh, you, you you do the group things, and then you come here that you're ready, kind of uh, you, know, you know where to go. I'm glad you. Yes. <laughs> to, yeah. yeah. You would have known that you have to avoid me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Why wasting one night here? Yeah. Exactly. No, that's, that's exactly the spirit. You can really uh, prepare and actually, it's, it doesn't replace it, but if you do it before, you do it after, it's fantastic. It's a great supplement to that. And also, what I'm a great fan of is I love learning languages, for example, this, this book, you know, Asimi, etc. And I like to interrupt. But when you go and have a, you go to a bar, practice. But what about meeting them later online and practicing also in a different setting? It's, it compl it's a compliment. Okay. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, maybe let's talk a bit about the motivation. What is the motivation? How can I get a native to be to stay in my island if I, let's say, I'm learning Chinese? Yes. Why should a Chinese go about I stay on my island and uh, just um, talk to a non-native? You know, it's like, and if we all are non-natives and stay in one uh, island, what's the reason for the point? So to talk to people who don't 
take lambs a broth of it. Okay, that's a very good point, and I would link actually to the ups. Go on. So this thing, this little app, you know, for language exchange uh, for ten times. Uh, what I heard that in some of the sessions, you know, when you, there was someone of you said, oh yeah, I learned Swedish, but I had to fight because, you know, to impose myself to practice Swedish when I was in Sweden, because everybody was speaking English to me. And that's an issue I had with Danish, for example. I was in Denmark, and nobody wanted to speak Danish for me because I mean, didn't speak English, German. Uh, French, so I had to say I was from Greek, from, Gre from Greece, and they would say, oh, so we have to speak Danish, so it's the only language I can. <laughs> um, so, uh, and to do this, basically, what I've done very often with languages, a small technique is, when I'm at the level A1, A2, maybe B1, very often I prefer, I prefer to practice with a non-native. Like for Chinese, for Danish, etc., I start, once I've read my Asimil book, <laughs> Once I've, done, I've read the book, or uh, teach yourself, uh, I go for, for this kind of practice. So the motivation is, initially, from A1, A2 to B1 level, I would interact with anybody who's even not native. Doesn't matter. Now the motive, so we would just meet like this and practice the language. It's even better for me. Once you start having this B1, B2 level, and of course, you want to have an, uh, a native project. And uh, in that case, there are two motivations. The first one, it's anybody can go there, so non-native. And the second for natives, it's financial reward. So if you say, I want a native, and we had that, we had some French teachers that we paid to be in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. So there are two models. One, it's just a community. We just meet over there and interact for free. The second, you say, I want a French teacher because I want quality, or a Chinese teacher. Then you have to pay. And that's the island's. Uh, we were mentioning about where you just you have real teachers and but there there's a financial uh, but I'm thinking you know what if I come to the world and I go to the Italian island where I you know I can actually be the native in there and I get credit the more time I spend in the Italian island I get credit then to spend in the Finnish island and pay by the beer and the sound and whatever so kind of I really I have an interest now to go there <coughs> just to get credit to then being a practicing island. That's a very, very good point, actually. But then now we're getting, that's really the gamification aspect. When you get the credit, that's a brilliant thing. And it's actually an even bigger reward than money. So there was a, if you see the, the talk I indicated before somewhere, um, yeah, that guy, um, uh, Gabe Tigerman, uh, he was actually speaking about credit. You only, you give money only when your reward system is not good enough. <laughs> So if you are good enough, you can give someone a status. We all function by status. Look at the nice bag I have, or the nice clothes I have, the nice t-shirt. Uh, so if you have a good reward system and you have a, a strong reputation, then you can do these kind of things. If you don't, then you have to compensate people, not by status, but by money. But that's second best, the money aspect. He was speaking in the village, so it was very, oh, really? it was an amazing, amazing talk like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I found his video is extremely good. So, yeah, please, go ahead. I would actually like to add an idea, not completely related to what you were presenting, but uh, also something uh, in regard to playing in a virtual world. So I don't know if any one of you have uh, heard about role-playing games. Um, so there yeah. are writing games, so you... Um, actually make up a character you want to play and you write about what he is doing and someone else reacts to it. I have actually done this since 2000, I think, in English and I okay. this greatly improved my English writing skills and it could actually also be done in, in other languages. So these groups actually also um, exist in other languages, it's usually done on forums. Back then in 2000 we were playing on, on uh, Yahoo mailing lists and okay. uh, things like that. So this is actually uh, not um, complicated technology, but mm -hmm. uh, you already need to have a relatively high level of the language because Usually the people who participate are native speakers, so you don't want to put them off with uh, uh, um, making really lots of, of mistakes. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. usually when I 
I join a group, so now I have a group uh, that I'm in for years, but usually then I say, okay, I'm not a native speaker, I'm going to make mistakes, can you accept this? And then you can actually um, interact and write with native speakers. So I also made great friends in, in such groups and uh, things like that. So that, that's also an option. Yeah. And do you, do you do that for other languages? or? Um, the thing is, there are not so many of the groups for other languages. So okay. um, I think there are some. There are some in Italian, there are some in French. There are, uh, I think, a, a bunch of such groups in German. Um, so I have not yet um, found a group in another language that appeals to me. So you have to look around a bit and, and see if uh, uh, their style of writing or their style of storylines appeals to you. So usually, the, um, or very often, the, the, those things uh, develop around fandoms. So for example, there are Harry Potter groups. Uh, there you can be... <laughs> There you can, uh, for example, uh, play a, a student at Hogwarts. You can be a character from the novel or you can be a character that you make up on your own. So the group I am playing in, it's just a, 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 a fictional town somewhere. We don't know where it is, but it, it's, it's somewhere. And uh, we are the people who live in this town. And uh, in the meantime, I, ha I play six different characters who are all um, involved in very complicated storylines and uh, so it's really addictive. I did not start it for language learning but uh, for fun but it also helped me to improve my English skills. Yeah and I think it's uh, uh, it, 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 can, it is really addictive as you said. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, wanted, I wanted to comment on that. Uh, the idea is brilliant. I work uh, in a project uh, sponsored by the municipality of Oslo and we work with the uh, uh, foreigners, uh, immigrants, refugees, uh, and we help them to practice Norwegian. So uh, we offer free uh, Norwegian practice. And what we do, we, we do it like in real life. And one of the things that we do is that we, we say, let's, like, I don't know, create the person. Because those people, often they're, you know, they come from uh, some conflict zones. And it's extremely hard for them to adapt to new life, new country, new language. They're scared, they're closed, they don't want to talk. You know, the, to learn a new language is the last thing people think about. And that's one aspect. The other aspect is that people are extremely afraid of making mistakes. Yeah. Like, even though you want to speak, you want to learn it, you want to communicate, so, like, you know, when you create another person, it's not you anymore. You say, I'm someone else. You're a girl, you say, yeah, but I create a guy. And then, you know, by taking the role of someone else, yeah, that you are you and you relax. And we, we have seen it work. So it really works and it makes people speak. And it's, yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, it's usually the opposite. It's usually a guy trying to play a girl. Yeah, but I mean... <laughs> 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 yeah, but I mean... I learned HTML that way. I was in a forum, nobody wanted to talk with me. I entered not like Claudia, but like Claudia. Everybody <laughs> I learned HTML in 30 days. And I built a career out of that. I always do it. It works. Okay. Oh, cool. Alright. Okay. Thank you, Claudia. And I got a boy. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. I think it's, uh, we have two minutes left, so if you have any other question, otherwise we'll have to... Uh, I love off. this, why I'm not in this virtual world to practice languages? Why I'm in this uh, uh, part of the group you mentioned, it's so hard to get in, but once you're in there, yeah. why I'm still waiting to go there? Why I'm not there? It's a very, very good point, and um, there's, there are two reasons to, the, uh, to this. The first one is, it's extremely troublesome to get in these bloody virtual worlds the way they are now. <laughs> Downloading this, uh, we, we tried this for several years. Downloading the viewer, getting your account in there, knowing how to move, it's, you were gonna say, it's easy, but we don't like to download it. Anymore. People told me that. Do you want me to download something, 50 megabytes, install it, click three times and say yes, and it's a pain, no. No, it has to be within now. And that's why there are different technologies now that we, are, we tried that, are, that make it possible to run it from this. And the only thing you do on from an iPad, switch on, you're in the virtual world. And that's why these things, I would bet, it's going to take off. Virtual worlds are going to take off. But they needed to have this breakthrough in technology. 
which was the easiness of a mobile phone, where you just even a cat can play with your little thing here, your iPad. And that's what you needed. But virtual was on computers are a pain. I love them, but they are they're not good. That's why. And that's why most of us have not tried virtual worlds before, because technology it's was for geeks. Real geeks. I think uh, we are there. Thank you very much for coming. As I said, I was very worried.